behind the scenes. She's still here. She just she's not live. Oh. Yeah, well, what's up? What? The thing to say, right? Stay safe. Exactly. What's up? What's up? It is Wednesday, 7.01 p.m., May 20th. Uh, we are coming to you live from the East Coast, except for Dr. Z, who's on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. As always, we like to give a couple minutes for people to get in, get settled. I always say there's sushi on the counter. Tonight is Mexican night. We have uh, tacos, tamales, enchiladas, um, uh, guacamole, and uh, and I think that's it right? That covers everything. So uh, please, as always, shout out. Let us know that you're here. Let us know where you're from. I expect to see Grace. Yes. Hello, Grace. It's good to see you. Um, anyway, everybody, let me know you're here. We're going to do a lot of Q&A tonight. So uh, questions ready. We've got a real program and we've got some really amazing um, guests with us, which I'm really excited to talk to. All right. So we'll give it another minute. Hey, Winky, how are you? I hope you got my emails. I, I, I finally got through all the emails, and so um, I think I'm caught up, and and uh, at least for today. So if you're just joining us, this is ACT, Acceptance Commitment Therapy, Volume 1. Please feel free to shout out, say hello, let us know where you're from, and we'll get to the basics and start introduce our panel momentarily. Hi, Therese in D.C., Rebecca. Yes, I got your email. Thank you so much. Perfect. All right, cool. <laughs> nice. I was getting nervous. People were getting angry. I was getting like people leaving comments in town halls. Like you haven't emailed me. I'm like, I'm trying. I'm trying. This guy get a lot of emails now. Um, man. Oh, doves in Manchester, UK. Man, I love Manchester United. I'm a soccer fan. I don't know if that's offensive or not. Um, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, uh, Nicole's in Southern Cali. Dr. Z's in Northern Cali. It's true. All right, we'll just give it one more sec. Let's see. Oh, you know, Grant from Honolulu, Hawaii. I don't think we've had anyone from Hawaii on the stream ever. That's awesome. Welcome. We're all going to come visit. Um, I know. I was supposed to be there like two weeks ago. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. We have Carlo from Rhode Island. Uh, not offensive, bit no football at the moment for sure. Definitely no football. Or, or as we call it soccer. Uh, Grace, the email crisis. I love that. I think I'm going to call it the email crisis from now on. All right, let's get rolling. I think the room will continue. Oh well, quickly, guys. If you don't know, Nikki from Dublin is a dear friend of every live stream. She is always here and she rocks. She's in Dublin, Ireland. So um, Nikki, what's up? Hey Barbara. Hey Rebecca. All right, so let's get rolling. Uh, thank you, thank you for joining us this Wednesday evening. This is ACT Acceptance Commitment Therapy Volume 1. That means that we're going to have two, but you're here for the inaugural uh, and also the second to last. So that's very exciting. Um, my name is Ethan Smith. I'm the National Ambassador for the International OCD Foundation, uh, which simply means I have OCD and represent the foundation in all things advocacy and media and just screaming at the top of my lungs that I have OCD and I like to talk about it. Um, so just some quick housekeeping real quick. This town hall is intended to serve as educational content and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment related questions, please be sure to work with your local provider or contact a local clinician. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline and should not be used if you are in distress or feel unsafe. If you are in a crisis or ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call 911 or call the suicide prevention hotline just below at 800-273-8255. Um, as always, I ask everyone here to, <laughs> Nikki says, of course, I rock. I love that confidence, Nikki. Um, of course, we always ask everyone to be respectful and kind of everyone else. Uh, we, have, we always have an amazing group of people. You all advocate for each other, um, but it's important to recognize that it's Safe is a place as we try to create this. This is also a public forum. It is being recorded. It will live on the internet live. So um, please continue to support everyone and be respectful of what everyone has to say. Um, with that, I'm super excited to get started. And if you're just joining us, welcome. Uh, we're going to be answering a ton of questions today, really Q&A driven. So uh, get your questions ready. Feel free to log them in. We've got people from Toronto, Long Island, Canada. Canada, Texas. I don't know why Texas and Canada look exactly alike. Uh, hey, Thomas, Anderson, South Carolina. 
So quickly, I would love to introduce to you our amazing panelists, who all of them, I honestly look, all six panelists that we'll have over the next couple of weeks, I look up to quite a bit. Uh, we will start just to my right left, because everything is backwards on the camera. Yeah. Uh, here we have Michael, Dr. Michael Towig. He is a psychologist in Utah and a professor of psychology at Utah State Univers University, where he co-directs the ACT Research Group. While he oversees university-based mm -hmm. clinic, his main focus is research and writing. He's published over 200 papers. Near, nearly all his work is on ACT with a strong emphasis on OCD and related disorders. Where there are many great parts about Utah, he specifically enjoys cycling and snowboarding, which is very, very true. He's a very athletic dude. I, I, I burn calories watching his Facebook feed and, and, and <laughs> most of the time. So, so, Mike, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Ethan. For sure. If you don't know, Mike is a bit of a uh, an act guru, and I've looked up to him for many years, so it's very exciting for him uh, to be on. Uh, next, uh, below him, uh, but but above him, or equal to him, is uh, Jesse Crosby. <laughs> Jesse is an assistant psychologist at McLean Hospital and instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He was the founding director of the Office of Clinical Assessment and Research at the OCD Institute. He works in private practice in clinical and consulting psychology in Lexington, Massachusetts. He is specialized in clinical and research experience with perfectionism, OCD and related disorders, anxiety, and behavioral addictions with treatment focus on acceptance and commitment therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, which is uh, Jesse. So thank you for being here. Happy to be here. Thank you. Jesse is also, this is a very insular group. Jesse, I met many years ago. I was wowed by him. He was also, which I learned in this, Mike's first student, not to age Mike. Mike was 13 when he had Jesse, so we're all <laughs> we're all really just, you know, years apart here. But uh, but Jesse is exceptional. Last but certainly not least is Dr. Patricia Zarita Ona, or Dr. C as she's so um fondly there was words following that, which I don't remember <laughs> them at all. So but that, that's Dr. Z apparently is easier. So we'll call you, we'll call you Dr. Z. Uh, she is commonly known. Oh, you have it written right here. All I had to do is read the script. Okay. Is a clinical, uh, Dr. Z is a clinical psychologist specializing in children, adolescents, and adults struggling with OCD, anxiety, and emotional regulation problems. Dr. Z is the founder of the East Bay Behavior Therapy, where she runs an intensive outpatient program integrating acceptance and commitment therapy and exposure response prevention. In addition to her clinical work, Dr. Supervisor and teaches doctoral students at the Wright Institute, a private graduate school for psychology. She's authored several books and workbooks, including ACT Beyond OCD, an acceptance and commitment therapy workbook for adults, and the ACT workbook for teens with OCD, Unhook Yourself and Live Life to the Full. Dr. Z is also the co-author of several books, Mind and Emotions, which has received a self-help seal of merit from the Association of Behavior and Cognitive Therapists. Dr. Z is a fellow of the Association of Contextual Behavioral Science. I used your long bio just in case you were wondering because I, I I thought it was cool. So, Dr. Z, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us, Ethan. Oh, it's my sincere pleasure. So, okay, I'm super excited. ACT is very near and dear to my heart. If you know my story, I speak about ACT a lot. Uh, love ERP, big fan, but ACT really, really, really brought everything home for me. It, it, it transformed my life and it transformed how I approach treatment and, um, and it really was a game changer when I was in the... Uh, in the throes and the darkest times of my own journey and my own life. So I'm super excited for this. Mike, let's start with you. Uh, give us a basic overview of what acceptance commitment therapy is and how it's utilized. Yeah, that's that's an easy question. So, <laughs> Okay, I can ask a harder one. I can find a no, riddle. I was being something. sarcastic like my 14-year-old <laughs> son. Uh, <laughs> so it's a type of cognitive behavior therapy and probably a standout feature of it is that we teach people how to not get intertwined with or how to like step back and notice whatever's going on inside their body to sort of choose whether or not you want to listen to what's going on inside your body and then in terms of behavior change we would love for people to you know choose their actions based on what's most important to them which is different than choosing actions that are based on what thoughts or feelings or emotions you're having at the time. So you can listen to them. It's just also okay not to listen to what's going on inside your body. I love that. Okay. It's, and actually great. No, no, that was great. And actually Grace, who is a, who's a, a friend of the live streams, 
to continue, she actually asked what exactly is ACT and how does it compare to say CBT? Um, so uh, uh, Jesse, do you wanna kind of break it down, CBT, the umbrella ACT and, and kind of continue on from where Mike left off? Sure. I think uh, I often describe it as a, it just changes how you relate to thoughts or the different strategies that you use to work with your thoughts. Sometimes you can do some problem solving and reason with the thoughts and try to uh, think differently change your approach, change your perspective. And that's often what you do with CBT. In ACT, you try to change your relationship with your thoughts in terms of like stepping back and observing them as thoughts and giving yourself, as Mike said, a choice in terms of how you respond to them. Uh, the big message there is you don't always have to respond exactly to the content of the thoughts in the same way that say, if one of your friends is just venting about a difficult day, you don't necessarily need to step in and solve all their problems. They probably just wanna hear hey, that sounds like a pretty hard day where you don't really get into it with their details of their concerns. Kind of doing the same thing with your thoughts where they come up, but you don't have to engage the content of your thoughts, more just looking at what they, how they affect you and then choosing how you respond based on what's important to you. That's perfect. I love watching, I love watching, not to, not to be, uh, I love watching Mike's pride in Jesse. He's oh, for sure. I, I, kind, I kind of feel like the, the visual I got was the emperor watching Darth Vader. Um, I don't know why that popped into my head, but it's like, yes. So I, uh, I kind of, I don't know. That's kind of where I went with that. So that's a good I, one. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, so we ha we're, we're getting a couple great questions here, uh, which I, I, I normally don't not dive into questions too early, but, uh, Dr. Z, well, first of all, did you have any, any thoughts on act that you want to add to, and then I can maybe, uh, throw this question out at you. Sure. I think I just would like to add to what Mike and Jesse say that, one of the, the ways that I think ACT is also different is that helps people to relate to fear and anxiety and worries in a different way. And, and I think also ACT invites people to relate to thinking in a very different way, right? Like we don't have to engage into every single thought. We don't have to respond to thinking with more thinking. And I think that's very unique to us, right? How we're relating in life, not just for ERP, but in life to fear, worry, obsessions, and anxiety, and how I am relating to thinking in general, even if I'm not doing ERP, right? Am I getting hooked onto every single thing my mind is telling me, or am I stepping back and watching what comes up? So I think that's a very unique um, new relationship that ACT is building. I love that. So somebody has, Shelly Richardson has a question here, which is how does ACT differ from ERP? So this is a question that I'm gonna to pose to three of you, which is, well, we can quickly, let's quickly, um, and any one of you can take this, let's quickly define ERP just for what it is. We can, we can do it quickly. And then let's make the separation. I think we just described what ACT was, but let's talk about how ACT can be integrated into ERP therapy and what are some of the ways to do that? So maybe, uh, Patricia, why wouldn't you quickly just define what exposure response prevention is so just we can... Sure, as Mike said, that's an easy question. Okay, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> we go for that. So I think the fundamentals and the basics of ERP haven't changed when there is a situation, an activity, a person or an image that has become aversive and scary to us, the best treatment is to approach, to lean, right? To get close to it. So exposure response prevention is about teaching all of us to approach those things that we are scared of and to discontinue any other behavior that we're doing, like compulsions or avoidant behaviors, right? That's the response prevention part. So that's my mini response for what ERP is. Perfect. Thank you. And it is important to recognize, to note that 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 ERP is the gold standard of treatment. It's what we turn to when we first get OCD, but there's just such amazing uh, research and data that has shown not only the effectiveness as ACT as an adjunctive treatment, but even starting it alongside it right away. I know there were some things for me that if I had known in the very beginning of treatment, um, some of those precepts and lessons that ACT taught, I feel like I would have had a, an easier time with ERP overall. So, um, so Mike, uh, what are ways in which ACT is currently integrated into ERP? Yeah. Oh, you know, one of the ways I, I did a project with John, John Abramowitz and one of the lines he used that kind of helped me think about how to talk to someone who really understands ERP, how to talk to them about maybe how ACT fits in well, like ACT might provide a, like a deep way and lots of methods to engage in response prevention. Like 
how to approach the things that we're afraid of. Like that's not all that I mean, it's difficult emotionally, but people aren't very good at is, you know, when the emotions or the thoughts and feelings boil up during or, or, you know, leading up to some type of exposure and you say, okay, I don't want you to run from that. I want you to stay with it. I want you to really embrace it. How in the world do you do that? <laughs> like that's, that's pretty darn hard. Yeah. I think act like we can spend, you know, hours and hours and sessions full of metaphors and exercises and, and trainings and, and methods to help people develop the skills that when that stuff boils up inside them, that they don't, they can notice it and watch it and not be pushed around by it. As Jesse said, you know, have a different relationship to it. And I think that can make being in the presence of really scary stuff a, a fair amount easier. And someone else can comment on values. I don't want to keep talking, but you know, values are another cool part of act that, that I think adds something to the, to its, uh, to the treatment of OCD. For sure. Jesse, so, so as you sort of, you know, developed into an, an, an act specialist as one of your, your fortes, how have you seen, how have you seen act, um, benefit exposure response prevention therapy and how have you seen, you know, your patients, uh, respond to ACT and, and then engage in ERP treatment as well. Okay. Uh, so a few different categories for that. I think in some cases I've seen people who are hesitant to do exposure therapy at, to start uh, for a variety of reasons, whether it's not understanding it or not being quite ready to dive into confronting some of their fears in that way. And so ACT provides a way to start to build some confidence and some effectiveness and sitting and, and working with difficult emotions and discomfort and kind of preparing them for and giving them some skills so that they can do some of that exposure at the right time. As Mike said, I think it can sometimes help make that experience uh, more effective. It doesn't always make it easier, but you can be more effective as you sit there with your thoughts and feelings and know what to do with them when you're doing the exposure therapy. And then, <clears throat> I think the, the emphasis on values really has been helpful. Uh, seeing this in research studies as well as in clinical practice where when you add a stronger values element to exposure therapy, and by that I mean really highlighting and emphasizing the reasons that a person is work, doing this hard work, why they would confront their fears, why they would expose themselves to these things that they try to avoid. And it's to gain access to those parts of their life that are limited by the OCD or, or struggling because of that. And that really can give some additional context to make the exposure bigger than just confronting fears, but doing things that's, that are hard for the sake of something better. I, I, I personally relate to all of that. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just, it just is, it just is. If you're just joining us, this is Act Volume 1. I always encourage, we're going to be a very Q&A based session this evening. So please, please feel free to ask as many questions as you like. We will try to work through them as quickly as possible, though I do have some follow-up questions. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Z, we hear a lot also about, you know, with emotional regulation, turning to DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy. I don't want to uh, bring too much conversation into that, but I would like to know what the primary difference is between DBT and ACT, because we hear there's a lot of mindfulness components in both things. So what's the primary differentiators between the two, just for people to know? Yeah, um, do you mind if I add something as to what no, Mike no. said moments ago? At the no, no, absolutely. we we'll jump to your question. Um, and don't, you don't have to be so nice next time, you can just do it. <laughs> I will be tough then, I will get cranky. How does it sound? <laughs> I, like, I like cranky. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to add, I think one of the, um, big difference I have seen my work with clients is that when you are working from an act frame, you're building a lot of willingness and you're building a lot of the intention to approach, right? I think facing our fears is brutally scary, right? It's not an easy thing. It's not that we wake up one day and we say, I'm going to face all my fears. It's actually hard. We run away. We feel like giving up many times. And I think act on the one hand, when adding all the values component, which makes a huge difference, it also adds so much more this intention about what am I going to do? Why am I going to do it? How do I want to do it? So all that willingness piece. Um, the other, I think, other um, addition that I think is um, super cool is that also we are more interested in helping clients to approach 
um, and to commit to the process of approaching, not to the process of getting things done or doing it right, which means that you're building a lot of curiosity about how things are going, right? When you're doing your exposures, what's happening under your skin? What is your mind doing? What's coming up, right? So I think the curiosity part is also key when you're blending act and ERP together, uh, which I think it's very unique to the model in general. Thank you, Dr. Z. I appreciate that. No, I and I totally agree with you. Uh, and then the follow-up is, can you maybe, yeah. It's the difference between ACT and DBT? Yeah. That's a very complex question. <laughs> okay, so guys, you can chime in. I'm um, really glad you got this question. Oh my gosh. Well, no, I'm going to throw up the mic since you got a really easy question before. <laughs> I, I just not to keep it right now, Mike. <laughs> I'm honestly asking for me, and maybe other people have to know, but I know that we we throw around mindfulness and values so easily when we talk about and you know engaging in effective OCD treatment and how values and mindfulness really really help. But then when you break it down, you know, for me, emotional regulation was an issue, so that became a DBT thing. But also there were so many things in ACT, so there's some in interwoven stuff too. So I just kind of wanted to quickly know like what the primary difference is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can I can tell you my tech today, May 20th in California, 4.22 p.m., right? I don't have the, the truth with capital T, but I can share some of the, the views that I have. Um, I think when we think about DBT, we have been exclusively think about emotional regulation. Um, however, if we step back, every single one of us, we are regulating our responses to our emotions, right? All of us as a continuum. And I don't think that's exclusive to DBT in general. I think it's part of being alive. Every moment I'm feeling something, sensing something, and that emotion is driving a particular behavior. Sometimes I respond to that effectively, sometimes I do it. So on that sense, if emotion regulation is a core um, process and a core experience that we all have, right? The question is, can ACT be helpful to, um, for a person that is struggling with ineffective responses even by a lot of emotions my answer is yes absolutely and i think there have been maybe seven or eight studies in which people have already piled acts for the ARP with different populations um so the way that i think is that ARP is going to invite people again to step back and watch all the emotion i know that is showing up how it shows up and how they can include more values-based behaviors um, by acknowledging that sometimes there is a chronic pattern of responding, go to behaviors they may have been reinforced, right? So I think what's different is that in DBT, you do have four specific um, skills you are going to be teaching. There is this tolerance, mindfulness, emotional regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. Um, Within ACT, I think it's not just the skills you're going to be teaching. You can teach actually one single core process, which is a stepping back and watching all the emotional noise that is coming up, right? So I think um, one is maybe more, um, I think DBT sometimes has this idea that you have to do something the way when you're feeling something uncomfortable. I think within ACT, the biggest message is to step back, right? There is nothing to be solved when you're feeling, you know, very anxious or worried or depressed, right? Um, even though the mind may tell you, I cannot handle this and I have to do something. So I think within ACT, we invite people to step back, right? So in that sense, we cannot reduce the skills to just four skills um, as you do it in DBT. Um, I think also in DBT, and let me know if this is a too long response. I'm happy mm -hmm. to pause. <laughs> I'm going blah, 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 blah here. Oh, we, we muted you like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> that was yeah. nasty. That was nasty. You are in problem. No, no, no. Actually, I was really impressed with your answer, and I was going to suggest we have to send you a $5 Starbucks gift card now or something. Like, I thought that was a really good answer. I don't know. Uh, Jesse or Mike, do you have anything to add? I, I, I just try to tell people that there's, there's often a lot of overlap and it doesn't so distinguishing some things but sometimes it's just a matter of of uh language or perspective but there are some unique elements to each approach and some of the really unique elements in act i think really stand out have to do with this the way that you relate to thoughts and this choice about whether or not you engage the content of a thought or the function of a thought and by that i mean do you try to decide whether that thought is true or false or do you look at the impact that that, is, that thought is having on you 
and choose how you respond to that without needing to solve what the thought brings up. So Mike, I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw you, and thank you, Jesse, I appreciate that. We're gonna get, you guys are asking great questions. We're gonna jump to them in literally five minutes. So again, if you're just joining us, we have three amazing ACT gurus here. So uh, get your questions, get them ready. We're gonna, we're gonna dive in shortly. I think we've answered a lot of questions so far. Also shout out to Valerie, hello, good to see you. Mike, one of the things I absolutely love about ACT is the fact that you don't need a mental illness to benefit from most of the stuff in ACT. It is really an amazing lifestyle to adapt. And, and, and when sort of in my own journey, when OCD stopped getting in the way of life and stopped dictating functionality, suddenly I felt like I had all these other tools at my disposal to handle life. I kind of describe it as like, I feel like I can see the matrix, so to speak. You know, it's like seeing the code and being like, okay, cool. Why, why is ACT so useful for everyday life, not just with OCD or, or mental right. illness? Right. So if you have a mind and can, can do language and you have emotions, then they're going to show up and they're going to like push you around at any single moment of your life. So like, I'm a guy who's a psychologist and I've been practicing ACT for, I don't know, let's maybe say 20 years. I'm, you know, I, I give lectures all the time and I'm sitting in a, in a spare bedroom, right? Talking to a computer. And even I have like a, this weird little bit of anxiety showing up and my hands are colder than they would normally be. And, you know, I wonder if, if I'm doing a good job. So these little things are going to show up for every single person on this planet. No, you know, no matter how long you've been practicing this stuff or no matter how much therapy you've went through. So something like ACT can help me say, you know, work on paying attention to Jesse or Patricia or you or, you know, sort of notice some of the questions. So where I'm kind of going is ACT can be there to help anybody who has language or emotions that might show up and might push them in some funny direction. And for most of us, that's there every five minutes. Like if I'm interacting with my kid, you know, I can think about like what would be the most values consistent way I can interact with my kid right now, or can I play on my phone, right? So, it, uh, it's you know, if you have language, it's there for you. I mean, the struggle will be there for you. Yeah, Jesse, as a, as a, whoa, sorry, uh, Echo. Uh, Jesse is a therapist. I'm echoing somewhere. Um, hmm. So Jesse is a. Uh, as a therapist and a, and, a, and, a, and a provider who specializes in ACT, have you, in your own life, taken things away from ACT and, and utilized them? Do you feel like you're more equipped as a human being because of the things that you've learned regarding ACT as a therapist? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, it, it, it's. I think the big part too is that a lot of the thoughts that show up for us, anybody have to do with your historical experiences, childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, and uh, things don't always go well or they don't go the well you would have wanted them to. And you, as you try to make changes, it can feel like it's hard to make changes because old memories come up, old thoughts come up and so forth. And when you have some tools to get some distance from those and then fundamentally to realize that just because they show up doesn't mean they necessarily define how you are, how you think or how you wanna be, then that gives you a lot of freedom to d decide and choose where you want to go, how you want to live your life. And uh, I think that can be tremendously freeing for anyone. It's been especially that way for me to um, really open the door for that. The other way that it's been really profound is I think I've noticed that our, our brains are constantly working really hard to understand the world around us. And uh, they do a lot of work to try to fill in all the gaps. So you get a limited amount of information about any situation and then your brain tries to fill in the gaps and make sense of everything. And sometimes that's quite useful, but sometimes our, our efforts to do so are either off track or at least kind of put us in a bit of a box. And the ways that our brain is actually trying to help us can sometimes box us in and make us hard to pay attention. And a big one that's helped me a lot is that it's made me more capable of learning from my experiences directly and not letting my thoughts and preconceptions direct and define me all the time. And so uh, in my middle age, I feel like I'm learning deeper and growing more than I ever have because I get so much more out of the experiences that I have 
than I did when I was younger and thought I knew everything and would take in a limited amount from the experiences that I'd have. Beautifully put, Justy. I appreciate that. Um, Patricia, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think I just, I really appreciate Mike and Jesse's response. Really sweet, very personal. For sure, for sure. So we are going to dive into questions. So this is going to get good. One thing I want to, and maybe I'm going to, maybe I'll judge myself a little too much, but as an OCD sufferer and as a very black and white thinker, I, I, I want to say that, you know, you might be struggling with ERP and I don't want this to be a, a stream where we are looking at a new modality of treatment because ERP isn't working. So what's this act thing? I don't know that that's a healthy way to approach this discussion. I don't know if Mike or Jesse or, or, or Dr. Z agree or disagree, but I really want to, want to, you know, I think when we're struggling with OCD, we want to use all the tools at our disposal to, to, to fight the disorder and get back to our lives. And, and, you know, ERP is the gold standard, but act is another adjunctive treatment and modality that is unbelievable. And, and, and together they're really, for me, we're a one, two punch combination. So I really want to look at it as a collaborative effort. Yes, this is act specific. Um, is, is that fair to say for everybody? Agreed. So uh, let's start with Rebecca. It's 7.13 p.m. She wrote, how would uh, this approach work for someone with germophobia? So I'll toss that out to Dr. Z uh, right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think um, one of the, the first questions I may ask is in which way um, this fear about germophobia is affecting your life? What are the areas, you're, the things of areas that are being affected because of this fear? What are the things you're not doing? Um, how is this affecting your relationships? I will try to understand first in which ways this fear is affecting different areas of your life, relationships, relationship with yourself, um, work relationships, career performance, you name it. Because I will be interested in look at the values, right? In which way something that is truly important to you, it's making it harder because of the germophobia. Uh, uh, Jesse or Mike, anything to add? Okay. Uh, and, you know, here's, here's Go ahead. You, you nailed it, Dr. Z. Um, one, one, you know what? Here's what I'll say, and this is going to apply to anybody um, that, 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 is, that is working through ERP. One of the, one of the things that really um, struck me with ACT and that really changed for my own lived experience um, my relationship to ERP and overcoming OCD was up until ACT, my therapists were telling me to fight your OCD. You've got to fight your OCD. And I had no clue what that meant. Hmm. I just knew that I was, I was miserable and, and losing my life. And, and, but like, and I had amazing ERP therapists finally after 17 years, but they were constantly like, you got to fight the you got to fight the OCD come on you got to fight it and i just didn't know what that meant right. and then when i started getting an act and really taking a look at values what happened was rebecca suddenly i replaced you have to fight your OCD with a what's important to me in my life and if i'm super depressed and hopeless what was important to me in my life it's okay that i don't feel it in that moment and b start to look at making choices as I'm either choosing a compulsion is the same as not choosing the value. So suddenly not uh, suddenly fighting my OCD was, Oh, I have to actively not choose to do this compulsion. I have to actively choose a value in my life. So in other words, uh, at the time, my career was very important. I wanted to move out to LA. I wanted to pursue acting. So with every choice of compulsion, I was actively choosing not to go to LA, not to act, not to follow my dreams because you can't choose OCD and values. They're mutually exclusive. And so suddenly the idea of fighting my OCD became about like, what choices do I want to make in life that are important to me? And every time I choose to compulse, I'm choosing not to do one of those things. And that really was one of the big um, shifts in my, in my treatment that really kind of helped me flip the light switch and really want to engage in ERP because now I understood why I was making the choices versus fighting off this nebulous disorder that was just making me uncomfortable. Do you mind if I say something, Ethan? No, no, not at all. 
I, I mean, I love, I loved what you said. So like one big thing that I, I'd say to every client is, um, and, and I forget what the big thing is that, <laughs> that what we're really trying to do is, you know, if we take the time away that people are engaging in avoidance actions and we shift that to values-based action, we're going to solve the problem. I mean, you can name a whole bunch of problems in life and it's worth spending way too much time trying to change the way we think and we feel and not enough time going after what's important to us. And you almost just said that. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, Jesse, did you have any, you nod and I don't know if you have a thought or you're just, you're, you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, I think it's about, it, it is about fighting, but you're, I think ACT can perhaps give you some tools to clarify what you should be fighting and how to direct your energy to the right places. Exactly. What's beautiful about that is you can apply it to any subtype and it, just like ERP applies, but you can apply that methodology to regardless of what your symptomatology is. And it's really, really, really cool. So, you know, if, if germs are an issue for you, Rebecca, you know, I would ask yourself, what are you losing by choosing to compulse? What are things important to you that you're actively choosing to not partake in? And that really helped me shift into. So great question. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Nancy Foster at 7.14 p.m. Um, I will then throw this to Dr. Z because it's an easier question than the question I threw her before, which is, do any cl clinicians practice only act without ERP? Uh, it's just, yeah, there you go. Uh -huh. Well, that's a classic. Um, okay. um, I don't think so. I think all of us were delivering act, were blending definitely act with ERP. I think, again, the basics of ERP remain the same, right? Every time there is something scary, whether it's fears of contamination, aggressive obsessions, sexual obsessions, we help people to approach. Um, I think when we are working with OCD and anxieties from an ACT frame, we're still doing ERP. The how we do it may look like a little bit different, right? We may have many more metaphors. I think about the mind as a content generating machine, all the time coming up with thoughts and a pattern making machine is creating patterns of thinking, patterns of um, sensing, right? But I think when you're working with OCP with anxiety, right, we're definitely, I think, augmenting ERP with ACT processes. Um, as a model act is already an exposure approach because we're inviting people to get in contact with all the yucky stuff that shows up when we're doing what matters. Um, and especially working with any type of phobias, anxiety, worry, OCD, I think we're definitely blending it. We're just augmenting ERP with um, different exercises and processes. Would you guys agree with that? Don't yeah. reassure her. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I, I think there's a, there's enough overlap too that it's hard to just keep it restricted to one thing. And so, if a therapist specializes in ACT, you most likely would do some really solid exposure work at some point in the process to help. And I think yeah. to, that Mike. Oh, and what, one of the the terms I use, like I'll use exposure exercises versus ERP because ERP traditionally has that like collecting a suds, engaging in the activity until the distress is at a certain level, hanging out at that level until you have some change in that distress, calling it a day, repeat, repeat, repeat. And then as you do that, you start to see a pattern of reduction in the distress when presented with the same stimulus. And we don't have to do all that stuff when we do ACT. So even when I, like we finished our big trial comparing ACT-based ERP to plain old ERP. In the ACT-based one, we never collected suds um we never asked how distressed you are during the exercise like we taught you know uh acceptance and diffusion and values and then we found opportunities to being you know practice your diffusion while being in a situation that might you know involve whatever contamination fear or whatever but then the exercises were tied to values so you know there's some characteristics and the way it's implemented that is going to look markedly different and you know if like we scored the stud the sessions from the studies and like everyone could tell they're different so there's some procedural things and um and like ways it's done that are, are you know worth noting well, we definitely we definitely don't want to upset all traditional ther behavioral therapists that that there are components of act that are built into erp automatically but i think you know act 
takes those out and then removes them and looks a little bit further and deeper and creates a lot more uh, going on. I know for me, it, it, it did. So um, real quickly though, we mentioned a few, I'm gonna call you out, Mike, because we mentioned a few uh, terminology that, that people may not know. So quickly, what is SUDS? Sure, subjective units of distress scale. So it's basically how worked up are you in this moment of the exercise. Okay, and then the other term, which I know it's a little bit longer explanation, but it's a, one of the most powerful tools in ACT, which is diffusion. Can you explain a little bit about diffusion? Right, so uh, it's seeing a thought or an emotion as just that. So if it had no evaluation, no judgment, it was just the event occurring and you didn't add anything to it, could you just see it as that? So if the, the experience we have of anxiety Anxiety, if you break it down, it's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening to your body. It's, you know, your heart's beating faster, your hands are colder, your hands might be sweaty, uh, your chest could be tight, you could be breathing more, you're having a certain set of cognitions. And then we as a society decided to call that anxiety. But really, it's not a thing. I mean, I teach this in my undergraduate classes. Anxiety isn't a real existing thing. It's a, a construct that we've put a name to. And if you could just experience it for what it is, it's like my body state is different now than it was before. That would be diffusion, just seeing something for what it is. So another quick example is like if you had an obsession, even if it's a really disturbing obsession, it's pictures about something horrible happening or a thought about something horrible happening. It is very, very different than the event happening. But our brain sometimes can't tell that difference. And we feel as though this horrible event is happening when eh, it's, I don't mean to downplay it, but it's a picture in your head. It's a pretty different thing. But it should help you see it as that. It creates room, it gives you some room to be able to maneuver and make choices and decisions when you're, when you're, when you're fused with your thoughts. Um, thank you, Mike, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I know we touched on this briefly, uh, but I'll, 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 hit, I'll hit Laura up. She's a, she, uh, comes to the streams quite often. Uh, Laura at 715, just under Jess, uh, Nancy's question. Uh, how is this different from mindfulness training? Uh, Dr. Z? That's a great question. Um, <coughs> uh, I think sometimes, and, and again, this is just my take, right? Um, I think when we think about mindfulness training, right, it's, um, it's def I think it's going to be helpful in terms of stepping back and watching what's happening under our skin, what's showing up in my mind, what am I feeling, what I am sensing. So I think it's a great addition by itself, mindful training, right? Um, but I think within our who we're talking, it's um, not only a stepping back from the internal experience, but also checking what is important to you checking what's really, really, I think, something that matters to you, how you want to be, how you want to relate to yourself when you're feeling anxious or scared. How do you want to show up to that moment when you're talking to your partner and you're you know, just, just getting triggered, right? So I think ACT anchors everything again under the things that matter to us, our values. And learning to step back the fusion is another um, process another skill that we may teach our clients. So I think mindfulness training, I see it as a great addition too, but I think within that we're looking a little bit uh, more than that, right? Uh, anything else to add, Mike or Jesse? I'll jump in because you do, you, you got us to a really good point, Patricia. Um, mindfulness training will fit very nicely within ACT but mindfulness alone has a lot of that element of noticing something, not getting pulled into it, being able to watch it. And at a big level, ACT adds in this like, and where do you want to go in life? And let's work on going there. And actually the data says, if you add behavioral commitment and values to mindfulness, you have a much stronger outcome. Excellent, thank you, Laura, great question. Thank Dr. Z and Mike. So moving on, I'm gonna throw this at Jesse. Uh, just before this question, Catherine writes, ACT is great for pure OCD where obsessions and compulsions are internal mental processes. Uh, just under that, Nancy Miller asks, and, and the way she phrases it sounds like she's a clinician, uh, what are some ways you use ACT to work with clients who suffer with moral scrupulosity around something they actually have done? That's at 7.17 p.m., uh, Jesse. And then I'll add run addendum uh, that, she, that she posted uh, 
Jesse, just to give you some context. Uh, she wrote parentheses, feeling intense guilt because they have intrusive thoughts about doing something that violated the moral code. Okay. Uh, so in this case, I think it becomes really helpful to help someone understand the function of an experience and uh, give them some tools for some flexibility about how they see that, um, that, that uh, um, if there's, it, it's not about whether or not they do it or not, um, that, that provides the discomfort, that the scrupulosity can show up um, even when they uh, have fear that they have done that or worry that they might do that. And so when they've actually done something to be able to recognize that that can also produce the same discomfort as when they worry that they might do that. Related to that then is this idea that um, <clears throat> uh, if they have done it, to connect to the actual part of the experience. And so when Mike was talking about diffusion earlier, he talked about trying to see a thought and the emotions and the physical experiences that come up as they are. And so sometimes I might do something where we say, tell me about the experience that actually happened and let's talk about what thoughts have shown up, what emotions have shown up and what physical sensations have shown up. Um, and then identify those as actual experiences that, that it is, yes, it is true that those thoughts are there, that those feelings are there and that those physical sensations are there. And then be able to recognize that they have a choice first and how they respond to those, that those thoughts, feelings and sensations don't have to define the experience and thus make the moral judgment for them. And also then to also have a choice about how seriously or literally they take those thoughts. So, for example, if someone has done something, feels the sense of moral guilt because of that, and one of the thoughts that comes up is, I'm a terrible person, uh, I'm a bad person. Those are two thoughts that, yes, those thoughts did occur, so we need to be validating that those thoughts are there, but then recognizing that they have a choice over both. Do they let those thoughts define them? Do they really take on that label of being a bad person? And also, um, do they even uh, continue to, to engage with that? So they might be tempted to say, well, I'm, I'm a bad person, but then I do all these good things. And so somehow they try to compensate for that and essentially just kind of get in an argument with themselves about whether or not they are a good or a bad person, which can sometimes end up pulling them deeper into the battle and reinforcing the thoughts in the first place. And so in this case, <clears throat> Uh, even when it's something that somebody has actually done, as opposed to the fear of something like that, you still connect to the actual experience as it is, and then help them find some choice in how they respond to it. Great answer, Jesse. Uh, Mike or Dr. Z, anything to add? No, I, I think a beautiful response. It was beautiful. Yes, I think Jesse is quite talented. <laughs> Do need to be jealous? No, the emperor is sitting there like with forced lightning <laughs> coming out of his hand. Um, <laughs> so, so, but I have a follow-up, which is, and, and I, can, I can toss this out to anyone. Um, so if I'm the sufferer in this situation, okay, yeah, thoughts, Jesse, but I feel it too. Like I feel it, so it must be true. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's when it's worth realizing that to notice the function of the feelings and that sometimes we use feelings to help us determine if a thought is true or not. And so as you do some act work with someone, you might help them recognize that is that uh, a workable or a functional thing to do when you do your feelings always indicate whether or not a thought is true or not, or are they just part of the experience? They certainly produce their own discomfort. And I'm always very careful to validate that, that this does not mean that this is somehow easy or that there is no distress, but uh, feelings don't necessarily indicate truth. They sometimes indicate the nature of a situation, but they don't always, they're not always consistent with that. So the idea of psychological flexibility is being able to choose and respond to those feelings based on what seems to fit the situation better, as opposed to just automatically assuming, I think this, I feel this, therefore I am. It's more, I think this, I feel this, I have a choice of who I am. Yeah, I don't know. Times, Go on, Mike. Sorry, Ethan. A lot of times our our emotions are, someone used the term conditioning, like they're just conditioned emotions. Like it doesn't make them untrue or un not meaningful. They're just a product of the life like we've 
we've lived. Um, you know, like if you think of biting into a lemon, you know, and, and your mouth feels that, you know, that, that weird feeling, it's just conditioning. Like, like you have that experience, you picture it in your head, you feel the feelings. Um, that's just how human beings work. If I can add something, I think one of the things I know this is that sometimes we're holding with some thoughts as rules, right? We call them ruling thoughts. And then we do exactly what a thought tells us to do. When we think about fear, um, maybe some ruling thoughts, examples of them will be, I cannot handle this because I think so, it makes me so. If I have like a bizarre thought, somehow that means something about myself, right? Or not doing anything to prevent that thought, it's the same as causing it, right? If I don't do anything to make sure I am not around my kids when I'm cooking with a knife, you know, I actually could harm them, right? That means, or, Another ruling thought could be having weird thoughts. It's hidden, masking my intentions, right? So I think we have been received so many messages about how to relate to fear and to anxiety. And sometimes we're holding with them with white knuckles. We do exactly what the thought tells us to do. And I love what uh, Mike and Jesse have been pointing that um, when having those types of thoughts, they seem very sticky, they are hard to let go as obsessions are. Trying to make sense of them will lead us maybe into more compulsions. Right? I'm trying to figure out. I'm replaying exactly what I did, how I say it, right? But actually looking how they work in my life. If I do exactly what that thought tells me to do, does my life actually get better and richer? Or do I actually go into, you know, getting more stuff, right? Um, so I think that is um that is something that is very unique again within act, right? Which I love to add that it's looking at that content looking how the thoughts look like it's not very helpful as looking what you do and how that works in that particular moment thank you dr z i appreciate that just looking at some uh questions real quick uh i can get to through some of these uh just really quickly uh, nicole uh, at 720 uh, if, if you actually replay uh the video you may come in late we actually discussed the difference between act and dbt so you can replay that there although we did not talk about distress tolerance which we can talk about uh shortly but we do go into in pretty in depth about act and dbt um uh real quick rebecca has a quick question but i think it's great and 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 jess we can probably find the links at some sort but i'll go down to each three uh mike what are your some of your favorite act resources online for people to access Yes, uh, contextualscience.org, that's probably the biggest ACT um, organization. So you can, there's everything you need. I mean, maybe a little more geared towards um, professionals, but there's a, a lot of information on there. It's just the way that whole organization runs. Uh, Jesse, any thoughts, favorite books, articles, websites? Uh, I think. Uh, the two books that I often recommend for people that are early in the process are like Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life uh, by Stephen Hayes and Spencer Smith, and then The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris. Both have a nice, pretty accessible entryway into the process. Great. Thank you, Dr. Z. Um, that's a long response for me. <laughs> Mike? I was going to not put you on the spot. So, uh, because Dr. Z just had a really good, uh, two really good uh, Act for OCD books. And uh, you have one or two. I just don't know if they're both out. That's my only pause. Um, um, Marisa, uh, what's your last name? I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed to not. Harris. Harris? No. Um, Matza. Yeah, Marissa Matza. Yeah. And, and Lisa Coyne and her co-author. I'm sorry. I'm just put on the spot. Just this summer, uh, just a nice collection of ACT and OCD books for consumers have come out. Um, so I would maybe you can post all three of those names, or you can find a link to the books. I'm not here to sell someone sell books per se. No, but no, it's okay. We just got some really nice resources for uh, people with OCD uh, to to learn about ACT. Some real nice. For sure. Books and, it, and if you're a teenager, actually, Lisa Quinn and Bed Sedley just came out with stuff that's loud. Uh, yeah. And 
and that's that's an awesome read. It's got really cool art in it as well, so you can check that out, Rebecca. Hopefully, that gave you some resources. I know Jess is behind the scenes right now, trying to pull up some of these resources to post. Um, so we'll get that taken care of. Uh, Dr. Jason Spielman at Anxiety and OCD Treatment Center of Florida has a clinical question, uh, which we'll we'll address quickly because he knows me personally. If I don't, if I skip his question, he'll yell at me tomorrow. And so. Um, at 7.19 p.m., I uh, ask all of our consumers and people with OCD to just uh, grab some popcorn or something real quick. Um, <laughs> what, what, uh, 7.19 p.m., what considerations have been made aligning ACT with the neural network model? So quickly, can we just identify what neural network model is and then, I guess, answer Jason's question in three minutes? <laughs> I'll throw it out to any one of you. I, I don't know if there's anything to connect those two um, in terms of like a neural network model and connecting it to larger neurobiology. I think the emphasis in, in, emphasis in ACT on experiencing things just as they are, including physical sensations and the thoughts and et cetera, and whatever neurobiology may underlie that I think is what the way that I usually approach it and just giving people more awareness and experiential learning capacity in terms of like integrating that specific model, I'm unaware of anything that might give you that resource. Uh, Mike, any thoughts or Dr. Z? I wish I did. I'd feel a lot smarter if I could, if I could answer that question, but uh, Jay nope. Jason, clearly these guys can't cut it. Uh, so no. you're gonna have, you'd have to bring the question back next week uh, when we have Marissa, Nate and Lisa <laughs> on and we can see if they can answer and then yeah, we'll give them a question. week to work on it. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Never mind. Deals off. Deals off. But actually, in all, in all sincerity, Jason, um, I can always uh, shoot your email out to some folks and see if we can get an answer for you. So thanks for the question. And always thank you for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Dr. Spielman was actually uh, one of the doctors on my original treatment team at Neural Behavioral Institute down in South Florida. He's now has his own place uh, in, in Wellington and West Palm. So he's a great doc. So thanks, Dr. J. Um, Thomas Thackeray at 7.19 p.m. What are some of the biggest hurdles encountered when using ACT? Great question. Dr. Z. That's a great question. Um, let me pause for a second. I think um, this is just anecdotal experience, right? I think when I'm working with clients, um, the degree of distress they're having because of the obsessions, the worry, the fears, it's um, it, it's definitely hard that sometimes when they come into the room, they just want to problem solve this as quick as possible. And the agenda is to have as um, less anxiety as possible. In fact, it's better if I never be anxious, right? Um, so I think when there is that agenda that of course makes totally sense when you're in distress, right? We don't like to be in distress. So I think when that comes, um, as the approach that we want to um, have for doing therapy makes it harder because we're inviting people, let's just step back a little bit and let's take a look how holding on to this is really working in your life. What happens when you're responding to thinking with more thinking, right? What happens when you're doing everything you can to get rid of the anxiety or change the thoughts, right? It's actually so much more time consuming. You put so much more energy, right? That your life keeps shrinking. So I think, I don't know if I will frame it as a hurdle necessarily, but I think in terms of when in the room, when you're working with clients, it's something to pay attention to because we may have to do more unpacking of all these all the strategies, of all these problem solving behaviors that the person may be doing. Excellent. Uh, Mike, or, Mike or Jesse, anything to add? For me, what I've noticed is that Sometimes you'll have these great moments in a conversation with a client where there's a little bit of insight or perspective and they get some distance from their thoughts. They have some more flexibility. They don't take their thoughts so literally. There's a little less con attempts to control their thoughts and, and more comfortable with uh, not having to run and avoid everything. But the traditional way of thinking about emotions and thoughts is in the communities around them and in their families and their society isn't always consistent with that message. And so you can have these great moments, but then as they interact with the world around them, watch things on and, and media and movies and so forth, it doesn't necessarily reinforce that message. And so a lot of the things that I'll do for my clients is we 
will have these experiences and then we try to put together some plans to help them continually access that insight and to to kind of help them uh, uh, keep it uh, uh, fresh in their mind um, and uh, because it can be it can be hard to keep thinking this way when it, you're trying to just get your mind wrapped around it in the first place and then when every comment you hear about thoughts whether it's from a grandparent or at your church or everywhere in between is telling you to control and push them away and just stop thinking about it it can be uh, hard to make sense of all that for sure and you know what's interesting thomas he's a he, thomas is a cool guy uh is uh the other thing i will add and, and this is actually the antithesis or the reverse of what but you know i think some also hurdles are how the clinician or practitioner approaches act i think mike originally described it really well which is you know, ACT is actually the methodology behind ACT is really heady. It's really like if you actually read the science behind it and what they're doing, because I was fascinated by ACT after I learned it. So I bought every book on ACT from a clinical perspective I could buy and read about it. And it was like really heady. And so like, I think if you have an ACT practitioner that teaches ACT in analogies and metaphors and symbolism, that can be really helpful. Uh, because as OCD sufferers, we're super analytical and want to figure out everything and know why it works and how it works. But I think a hurdle for a clinician is if you're trying to describe ACT in a clinical perspective, that could really backfire for somebody that wants to analyze everything and things like that. So kind of a reverse hurdle, if you will. Um, I appreciate there's so many great questions here. Uh, if we don't get to your question, we have a volume two. Uh, we plan for this, uh, but we can always have this group back again and do something else. So don't, don't fear. Um, Ashley R. at 7.21 p.m. This is, uh, what are what are the ways to inform my therapist that I need to try different approaches like ACT instead of doing just a CBT approach? I saw a new therapist today and asked her if she primarily treats anxiety. Uh, we'll leave this up for just a second because we're blocking Jesse. He's never been so good looking. Uh, see, <laughs> see, Dr. Z, I pick on everyone, not just you. Um, so there's one thing, there's one thing. I know. There's one thing I want to add quickly. I think people people make um, people that, that are getting help for OCD think sometimes do getting sorry words. CBT is not always exposure response prevention. CBT is the umbrella. ERP is under that. But just because you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't mean you're doing ERP. And if you're not doing ERP, then you're not necessarily doing what's best for OCD. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. Just because you're doing CBT doesn't mean that you're doing exposure and response prevention. With that being said, now that everybody's forgot the question, what are uh, what are some great ways to like bring up with a new therapist? Hey, I, I you know I'd really like to try some some other stuff. I'll throw it out to any of you. Well, when I read the question, uh, I mean, I'm probably by my answering, I do the least therapy of, of anyone in this room. <laughs> well, I do more than you, Ethan. I hope, right? What? I said I do the least therapy, but I, I hope I do more than you. You do. You definitely. I don't. I don't do therapy. I'm not a clinician. Um, <laughs> well, the thing I'd say. I mean, I do run a clinic, and and I think uh, clients should be consumers. And it is. It's just fine to walk in to your therapist and say, "Can you give me? You know, can you explain to me really what you do? Like, what is your model? How do you see change happening? Like, what kind of work are we going to do in this session?" And if the therapist is like, you know, like, you'll see, I think it's really fine. And and I know it's a little harder when you know, the client has already a diagnosis of OCD that they may think, oh, this is checking. And you can just say, this isn't about regulating my emotion. I just want to know what I'm getting into, what kind of therapist you are, what kind of work you do. And we, like, we're very upfront about that in my clinic, what we're going to do. We say we do ACT, we talk to them about what ACT is, we talk to them about how it might be different than traditional cognitive therapy. If they know what ERP is, we'll talk to them about similarities and differences and they can choose to do that work with us. So uh, when I saw that long question, I think having a conversation about what you're signing up for is really, really reasonable. So no, I don't, I mean, you'll feel uncomfortable doing it, but it is, I mean, it's a great thing to do when you're getting a therapist. For sure. I think you can absolutely advocate for what you need. The IOCDF um, website, iocdf.org, 
has some great articles on how to interview a therapist mm -hmm. and what to ask them to make sure that you're getting the right therapy. It's ERP specific, but we can always add act to that. And I would say, actually, I honestly don't know. Um, and it's not important, but I don't know your exact diagnosis if it's OCD or or something else. But the reality of it is, uh, you said you just saw today for the first time. It's okay to say, listen, you know, I have OCD. Let's we'll take OCD for instance. You know, I know I need exposure response prevention. I've struggled with it in the past. I feel like acceptance commitment therapy could really be beneficial in integrating that into my therapy as well. Can you do those things? And and there's specific questions you can ask uh, to make sure there's certification. Go ahead, Doctor Z. Yeah, I just want to chime in and add that I think as clinicians, it is our ethical responsibility to share with our clients how we work and how it's going to look like, right? So it doesn't have to be this mysterious thing when you're going to therapy, right? So I think interviewing your clinicians, asking the questions, it's completely appropriate, makes total sense, and it's our, um, it's our duty to actually share with you how we work. Absolutely. And I think the unfortunate thing, and this comes back to the advocacy that we do and the IOCDF and everybody involved that have dedicated their lives to this and was a pitfall in my life is that unfortunately, you know, I went to 10 different therapists that all thought they could treat OCD and none of them knew ERP. I didn't even hear our ERP until 17 years after I was diagnosed. I did psychodynamic. I did talk therapy. We looked for trauma in my past. Um, and I think that I don't think any of these Doctors were malicious in their intent. I think they truly believed that they could treat OCD. They just didn't know how to do it. And so, um, and so, you know, there's definitely a balance between they may openly disclose, but we also, it is our job, the IOCDF's job, other doctors' jobs, peace of mind, nonprofits, advocates, to make sure that we can arm all of you and ourselves with as much information as possible to put ourselves in the best position for success with treatment. Um, Thank you. I'm not usually this intelligent, but you guys have raised my game because I'm kind of intimidated by all three of you. So I'm like, kind of like, you know, I'm on it today. Um, <laughs> thank you. So um, this is a great question. We kind of touched on this theoretically, um, but this puts it in a more specific example. So Lily at 722 PM says, can you give an example of applying act versus ERP to an, obs to an obsession? For example, afraid to touch a doorknob or any other OCD example. So, uh, Jesse, do you want to take this? Sure. Uh, I think uh, if we start with an ER approach, what we might do is identify where this obsession fits on a hierarchy for you in terms of how much distress it causes. And... Uh, and then start to do some work as an ex from an exposure perspective to repeatedly expose yourself to that uh, experience of touching the doorknob, watching for the habituation to occur, watching for your distress to change and so forth. Um, from an act point of view, uh, the way that I might approach it is to ask about the obsession, to talk about the thoughts that come up related to that obsession, to talk about the feelings that come up to that with that obsession as well as the physical sensation I try to collect a lot, a lot of that information up front as though I'm just kind of asking questions and analyzing the situation, but I think it also starts to introduce a skill to teach the client to be an observer, to notice what they're thinking, to notice what they're feeling, to notice what their body's feeling. And so even just so, while collecting information or will it feel like collecting information to the client, we're already training them to be an observer of their experience. Then the next step we're gonna look at an act is um, what that function, what the function plays for them of avoiding touching the doorknob. So when they don't touch a doorknob, when they avoid it like that, what are they trying to, to accomplish? Typically involves some kind of control theme where they're trying to avoid or control the experience of certain emotions, most likely anxiety emotions and specific fears or worries about po possible contamination or disease. And uh, look at the impact that that's having, essentially work, look at the workability of that. So asking them, in your efforts to avoid these doorknobs, what impact has that had on your fear about this? What impact has it had on your ability to not feel that, to not have to deal with those thoughts? And trying to identify that sometimes our attempts to avoid or control a thought or emotion actually um, end up reinforcing it, sometimes bringing us into greater contact with it more often, sometimes with more intensity, and starting to recognize that all of our efforts to avoid or control a thought or an emotion sometimes entangle us with it. And that would be the initial phase of what you might do with it. 
and then uh, I'll, you know I can pass it on to Patricia or Mike to see if they want to take it from there. Do you want to jump in? I think um, Mike, do you want to jump in? No, go for it. Okay, so I think um, what I will do, um, I think the process that Jess is calling, I would just sometimes call it like mapping, mapping what's going on with this obsession, mapping how you're responding to this obsession, what are the compulsions, what are the avoidance behaviors, and how that's showing up in your life, right? What's the consequence? What's the impact of this, right? Um, I think from that, I will definitely go into um, values clarification. I like to do maybe two or three exercises to understand what's truly important for my clients, in which way all these OCD related behaviors are affecting who they want to be, how they want to show up to others, how they want to show up to their career. Um, and I will use the values to anchor and build more of these exposure menus to approach every single exposure exercise we're going to be doing, right? Um, so I think I will go, maybe if I can summarize, will be from mapping all the OCD behaviors, how they're impacting a person's life, looking at the values, and then using the values to um, build more of these exposure menus. And we're going to actually brainstorm together different exposure exercises we're going to be doing. Um, and now I can pass to Mike so he can continue. <laughs> well, I mean, I've loved, I've loved listening to both of what you've said because that's how we would do it in our clinic too. We, we use like sort of acceptance and diffusion and values. We build up those skills. And once I, you know, for me, I say this is somewhere between three and six sessions. And once they get that, have some of those skills can do that, then we start practicing it. And you can practice that during session. You can practice that between sessions. Um, so I think where, where Jesse and Patricia were going was if you build up, I'm gonna use the term psych flex, but it's just a term that encompasses acceptance and diffusion and values and things like that. Once you've built that up, now you can practice doing it in real life in values-based situations. I think one thing that um, if I can add a little bit, I don't know how it's for you guys, but one of the things I know this is that when doing values clarification exercises and checking what's really important for us behind all these, um, OCD related behaviors, I still hear sometimes uh, some goals like I want to be less anxious, right? Or I just want to do, I just want to get it done and do as quickly as possible. So I think I also try to look at the workability of having those expectations or holding to those thoughts, right? Because quite likely when you're doing exposure practices, if you don't have this frame about why we're doing this, why we're approaching this thing that I'm really scared, they are going to show up either way, right? So I'm actually listening where, how my clients are um, framing maybe or thinking of the work we're going to be doing. Because I think it's hard to deconstruct the idea that we don't want to be anxious and therefore I want to keep doing more problem solving, right? So I think the process, as Mike was saying, it doesn't happen in one single session, right? It goes like, you know, a couple of sessions. And even after that, sometimes these all behaviors that have been reinforced because we're socialized with that, they're going to kick in, right? They're going to pop up. So I think it's helpful, at least, you know, when I'm working with clients to look into that again, why we're doing this, this is hard thing about approaching what we're scared of. Thank you, Dr. Z. Thank you, all three of you. That was, that was, that was awesome. I love this question, um, debating between, uh, uh, Belinda, if you're still on, I see your question. I'm going to back up to it in one second. Um, We'll answer this super quick. So just at 7.28 p.m., uh, Brooke Denise Krogan, this just applies to what we can answer this quickly. She's like, so is sitting with and tolerating your emotions until your anxiety goes down outdated? Because that's what I was taught to do. This is why I made the preface at the beginning. Um, so uh, again, you know, what are, what are we talking about in conjunction with ERP here? Mike, I know you're dying to say something. I know. I have zero poker face. <laughs> uh, so, so is sitting with your emotions uh, waiting until it goes down? You know, it's, here's the data. Like, uh, I'm, I'm a researcher. What the data say in 2020 is that you would tolerate. Okay, this is like one camp. You would tolerate through all your treatment sessions. A whole 20 sessions later, your anxiety goes away. So. 
it's being open to your anxiety could, this is what researchers say, being open to your anxiety could possibly lead to a lessening. My take is be open to your anxiety because that's what's going to work for you throughout your entire life. So if you are open to your anxiety, your experience of anxiety will just be very different. It, it will not be as diff. like I sometimes give the analogy, like instead of carrying around a bowling ball, you're carrying around a pool ball. Like you still have to carry something around, but if you're open to it, it becomes a different thing that's easier to have. And I think in the term toleration is like, if you tough it out for long enough, it'll disappear. And I would never promise that to anybody. I don't think anxiety disappears. I don't think that's how conditioning works. Um, so as a field, we've really shifted from if you tough it out, it'll drop to if you tough it out, it'll drop over a really long period of time to where I sort of stand, which is make space for it and find a way to comfortably carry this around for you for the rest of your life. And honestly, it will not be the same struggle that you've been you've been in and you've been picturing. It's an interesting perspective. I haven't seen it that. So yeah, the, the weight definitely changes as you carry it through your life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Jesse or Dr. Z, anything to add? Well, I think, uh, you know, even, even it just, it changes your perspective on what it means for your anxiety to go down. And it may be that when people would experience habituation as effective when doing regular ERP, that that's also what was occurring, that the, that the anxiety that they felt and the way they experienced it started to shift and to change. It still may show up, but the weight of it has changed. The distance from it has changed. The intensity has changed. And so uh, that can be helpful to both validate um, the, the approach of, of sitting and tolerating, but also recognizing that as, as time passes, the function shifts. And so your anxiety, while still present, and if you're open to having it show up however it shows up throughout your life, it may, your relationship to it is very different, which can affect fundamentally how it feels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dr. Z. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question. I just want to add to what Mike and Jesse were saying that um, in, my, in my undergrad, I was heavily training all the habituation model, all the traditional exposures, and then the research has changed that to the inhibitory learning model. We don't have to go there, but one thing I can say is that in my work, asking my clients to sit with anxiety until it goes down, that was one type of message. But I think inviting people to choose to experience the anxiety, even though when it's yucky, because it gets them closer to the things that matter to them, is a very different frame, right? So I think the criteria for exposure work, it's not whether it goes, my anxiety goes up and down, right? It's about how I am approaching my life, right? Am I doing the things that are important for me? I'm driving over the freeway, right? So I think um, this idea of choosing again to make room for the yuckiest stuff that comes up because it matters to me is a very different frame. Um, I think tolerating sometimes also may come across as let's power to this or let's get it done. I think we're inviting people and we invite ourselves to be more flexible to see the, and make room for that, that is stuff that pops up. Thank you, Dr. Z, absolutely. I think I'm looking down at some, um, some other questions and Belinda, I'm gonna get right back to yours. I think we may wrap up with yours. I know a lot of people have great questions and um, a lot of people are trying to discern like the different aspects of ACT. There's a lot of great questions, but I think that at the end of the day, ACT, there's a lot going on with ACT and there's a lot of different precepts and, 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 and tools and skills within it. It's not all or any one thing. And so um, ACT is, is somebody asked down the way, um, is ACT just sitting with your emotions or is it or is it following your values? And I think we're just trying to find some certainty about ACT is, and it's, it's yes, it's all of the things. And um, we gave some resources out beforehand, which we will definitely encourage people to go to, and you can learn way more about ACT and how incorporated into your treatment and things like that. Belinda Seeger, who's a new name, I, uh, some of you may know her, um, she wrote some great comments, which as always, everybody's advocating and leaving great comments. So please feel free to go through the comments and see. Um, it looks like she's from the anxiety and OCD treatment of Princeton. Um, so Belinda, thank you for being here. She has a great question. It's from a clinical perspective, but I think if we can answer it from both perspectives, this would be really helpful for sufferers as well. She asked questions about, uh, sorry, Jess, this is at 725 PM, uh, Belinda Seeger. 
question about what you would ask a client to do when their OCD tells them they cannot or will not be able to get better. I think this is so huge because I was there and I know so many people that have been in this position and felt like my OCD is special, it's different, um, regular stuff doesn't work for it. You know, what, what, what do you tell a, a client to, to help shift, to get them in a mind frame to, uh, to be able to embrace treatment and willing to get better? I'm going to throw this out to all three of you because I think it's a really big question. Uh, 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 best looking can start, uh, Jesse. I will jump in. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think um, uh, this is probably where uh, I do my most work with clients, actually. Um, as much as people will come into my office because of specific OCD concerns and, and so forth, I, I, we often re start to refer to them as their core symptoms, uh, whether it's fear of germs or fear of harm or whatever the OCD subtype might be. But most of the therapeutic work ends up happening in this space of the, the thoughts about the process the thoughts about the symptoms, the thought about their ability to succeed in the treatment, the thoughts about their ability to get better or to work with their OCD. Um, uh, in, in, in the science side, we call it metacognition, thinking about thinking. And our brains are infinitely capable of this. We can always step back a level and think about what we were just thinking about, and then step back another level and thinking about what we were just thinking about and what we were just thinking about. And it can just go and go and go. Anytime I stumble into a room that has two mirrors on either side of the room on each wall, it's always a neat reminder of that, how our mind just has this ability to continue to step back and observe and think about our experience. It is both a helpful space because it's where we do some effective treatment, especially from an ACT perspective, but it also can be a troublesome space because you can have thoughts like this, that uh, I cannot get better or I will not be able to get better from this problem. Um, and one thing that can make them especially sticky is they happen in that metacognitive space. And for most of us, when we're in that space, when we're thinking about our thoughts, we're used to being in a more analytical mode, a more thoughtful mode. It's the mode that we're usually in when we're in therapy sessions, when we're talking about our symptoms, when we're thinking about our symptoms, when our therapist is taking us seriously and talking to us about it. And so when thoughts show up in that metacognitive space, they sometimes feel more sticky because it's a space that usually we take pretty seriously. Um, we've learned pretty well to be uh, fighting back and pushing hard against the OCD core symptoms like the fear of the germs or the fear of harm or whatever. But when it comes in this metacognitive space, they can be sticky. The good news is, is that once you recognize that these thoughts are troublesome thoughts, just like your core symptoms say it was the fear of germs were, you can apply the same set of skills and you just have to learn to apply them at that next level up. Not only do you apply them at the core level when you have that fear of contamination, but then when your mind says, I don't think I can do this, you then notice that thought and apply that same set of skills to that thought. And then if you have a further thought about that, you can then step back again. And so it's just as much as an anxiety mind can always come up with a possible reason to be concerned or a fear about how things are going or what the future will bring, uh, that same capacity in our mind also gives us the ability to step back and notice that thought, observe it, and then make a choice about how we want to respond to it. Dr. Z? I think that was what first, that was a great question, and that was such a very nice response, Jesse. Um, my response is a little bit short, right? Uh, I will just add to what Jesse is saying. I think no matter what the content of the path is, we can appreciate the struggle, yes. But the process remains the same, noticing what the mind is doing, checking how it works, and then remember that I have it within me to choose. It just happens that maybe I didn't have excuse to choose my behavior, right? Uh, but we apply to all types of thinking, regardless of the type of content, regardless how the thought looks like, whether it's about myself or about what's going to happen with therapy or am I making the OCD this or that, right? Just notice that, check how it works if you do that particular um, behavior, and is that helpful to you or not? Go ahead, Mike. No, I love what, what both people say, uh, both, both of you said. I'll just offer like what I'd literally say in a session if a client said- That's what I was gonna, I was gonna ask, yeah. yeah, perfect. I don't like, I don't believe I can or will get better, it literally won't happen. 
I would probably just say that is a very interesting thought. <laughs> what thought preceded that thought? Let's wait a couple seconds. Tell me what the next one that shows up is. And why did you choose to listen to the middle one? Mm -hmm. I might say something like, just walk around for two minutes and notice everything your mind throws out. Those are all real thoughts that showed up in your head. What, which ones are you going to choose to listen to? Like literally, as I thought here, I thought I got to water my plants. Uh, you know, I, I interestingly purchased a left-handed mug, not a right-handed mug. Like, huh, it's just a thought. Like, I can choose to listen to it or not listen to it. They just, I just started asking if there was a left-handed mug. Anyway, go ahead. I have a left-handed mug. The picture's on that side, not this side. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But see, that's their mind. It just like throws stuff out. And why did the person grab that one? It It is as accurate as my concerns about my mug. This is, this is a topic that, I mean, this is probably out of all the emails I received, this is the biggest question, you know, is like nothing else is worth. So actually, I, I don't typically, we haven't ever role played on a town hall, but I want to do it a little bit. So Mike, if, if I came to you and I said, um, you know, I don't think I can get better or will ever get better. And, and you replied with, with your, with your statement yeah. that you said, then yeah. my, then my question, then I would follow, I immediately, when you answered that followed up with, yeah, but I've been to 10 therapists and I didn't get better with any of them. And that's not just a thought that's proof that I failed all of this time. So I clearly right. can't get better. And I noticed that that pattern of thinking you're having right now, is that really pushing you around? Is that almost pushing you to stop working with me? Yes. Trying. Yeah, it, it pushes me to not believe that you can help me too when everybody else said they could and you're saying the same thing. Well, I, I'm okay with you believing that I can't help you. Like I'm okay with you buying like that that's there and has a lot of power. Can we have it be there and have it, lot, have it push you strongly and could we still take steps forward and see what happens? Like, can you have a mind that yells at you and can you and I still try while your mind yells at you? It's a great question. I was thinking about if I were, if it were 10 years ago, I would have cried and yelled at you and cursed at you. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's so hard in that moment. I've been, I've literally, that's why I like Belinda's question. And I know it relates to so many sufferers as I've been in that exact position where there was, cause you're also dealing with, you're not only dealing with thoughts, but you're dealing with at that point, there's also probably a lot of depression that is existing, a lot of hopelessness. And that's playing a huge part in this, this not only thought of like, well, I have all this proof or, or I feel this way, but I also, really feel there's this, I don't, I, I feel, I don't feel hope. And so it's like, there's, there's not only like the flexibility, the psychological flexibility that you're talking about, but the, the, the genuine willingness to, to want to make an effort and change, which then also, I guess, comes back to um, the discussion about feelings. Like how, how are we going to listen to our feelings right now too? And are there our feelings betraying us? I don't know, Jesse, do you have any, I think uh, recognizing that sometimes these thoughts do come with a lot of heavy bags is really important. And uh, for for me, I found it helpful to start with like kind of uh, joining you in that space and validating you in that space. Because I think if you hear anything that somehow invalidates that experience, it uh, can kind of shut down the opportunity I might have to introduce anything new about how you might relate to those thoughts. And for people who are going through this experience with, with your own therapist or just on your own, you'll notice how that hap happens a lot is that um, we are so sometimes so stuck or so in such a suffering place that it's hard to hear information as it's presented to us. And especially if it has any familiarity to us, to anything that we've tried before, but didn't work. And uh, it sometimes takes some courage to say uh, this sounds uh, familiar or this sounds hard or this sounds like it might not work, but to kind of stay open to that process in a way you use the act skill of being willing to, to embrace it and say, let's see if we can just hang out with this for a little bit longer and see if there's something that I haven't heard before or wasn't ready to hear before in this, in this time that I do it. Um, 
yeah, it's, and our minds are just trying to help. They're trying to make sense of things. They're trying to help us understand the world, but sometimes we can quickly close down to what new information be right, be right in front of us that could really be a help. I love that, Jesse. Dr. Z, I want to end on this circle because I think it's a great conversation. The other, the last sort of point that's coming to mind with all of this is do I have to make the choice to believe what Mike or Jesse is saying in that first session? Yes. <laughs> yes, you will be in good hands. Yes. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? Like, is it is it is it a pro is it a process? Is it going to be a process for me to sort of up my willingness to buy into this? That's a great question. I think my response will be that um, we will learn by trying and by exploring and seeing how it goes versus getting actually consumed with what the mind is telling me, right? So I think there is a lot of openness in terms of the, are you open to have those thoughts and still do X, right? I was still open to give it a trial here. So I think more than learning with more thinking or engaging in content, it's more trying to learn with experience. If I got your question right. Yeah, a hundred percent. I was just basically getting at, you know, sometimes the instant gratification of our OCD kicks in and it's like, well, you know, I don't, maybe Mike came back to me with all the right things and I go home and I don't believe him, you know, but maybe that's okay to not believe him. And maybe yeah. I just have to show up the next day and keep, and keep working at it and keep trying to stretch it till it gets a little bit more flexible. Yeah. So I think, and that's a very common process, right? It feels very counterintuitive when we say, yeah, let's know this a thought, we get that you're struggling. But I think uh, it's really all about, let's take a look when you and I go into this back and forth about what's true or what not, what's right, what's wrong, what happens to that work you want to be doing? Is this really how actually you want to live your life, right? So I think there is a lot of subtlety in terms of not getting engaged with convincing a person of think differently. Or then they just, I believe what you're saying, I agree with you, but actually invite them to try and be open to see how it goes if we go along with this, right? Thank you, Dr. Z. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Nate Gruner who we'll have on next week. I remember him telling me uh, later on, it reminds me of when I was talking to him about, I think it was just exercising. It was we were catching up and I was telling him I was having a hard time working out or going outside. And like, you know, he's, and I said to him, I said, yeah, like my brain will go like, you, you got to work out you got to go outside. It's really healthy for you. Healthy for you. You can't stay in and work all the time. And the other half will say, yeah, but you have to work. You, you've got to do all these responsibilities. People are re relying on you, you know? And, and, and I, I kept telling him I was going back and forth. He's like, well, can you let your brain argue with itself? Why then you go out and work out? <laughs> and I was like, say what? And he's like, well, can you let both of those voices just argue and then you take that argument with you and go do what you need to do? And I was like, I suppose I can. And it was just kind of mind blowing. Like it was like, I don't know. I love that. I love, I love this. So anyway, um, I know we're a little bit over time. I want to thank uh, very much Mike, Jesse and Dr. Z for, for, for joining us tonight and offering their expertise. Um, again, we will, we will uh, post, uh, this will post, um, to Facebook and YouTube. We'll put some links to, uh, to some of the books and resources. Um, if you guys are interested in asking any of, 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 of questions, direct questions to Mike, Jesse, or Dr. Z, please feel free to uh, email info at iocdf.org. And we will make sure to forward um, your questions onto, onto, uh, onto them um, or, or myself. Uh, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we are going to be hosting along with Peace of Mind re-engage social life and work environments, how to interact with your loved ones, friends, and coworkers. This is getting out of COVID and into sort of re-engaging in life. That will be with Liz Mackingvale and myself. And then on May 23rd, uh, this coming Saturday, we're gonna have a town hall with teens, for teens, by teens, with teens. It's gonna be teens. So families, uh, teenagers, definitely join us. Uh, as always, I wanna thank the IOCDF, uh, our partner behind the scene, Jesse, who's doing all the work with the graphics and answering your questions. Um, if you haven't already and want to be notified about all the programming the IUCDF is having over this month and next month, A, we just launched a calendar with Jesse. I, is, I think there's a link. I don't remember the link, but there's a calendar on the IUCDF website with all the virtual content that we'll be, we'll be continuing to have um, even way beyond uh, COVID. Uh, we, love, we love doing this. 
and uh, and and love creating content for everyone. So we're here to support. Um, but if you haven't already, please be sure to follow and subscribe on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter, so you're notified at all times um, when we have uh, content going on. Until then, uh, and thank you for spending your Wednesday night with us and uh, and taking time out of your busy schedule. So volume two next Wednesday, seven p.m. Eastern. Again, thank you, Mike, Jesse, and, and Patricia. I like rolling my R with your name. Patricia. It makes me feel like romantic and suave. I don't know. Until then, uh, so, yeah. I know. Uh, have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Stay vigilant. Feel all the feels. Don't let OCD off the hook during this time. Uh, be willing to do all the stuff that everybody said because it really is is gold. And until next time, we will see you later. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.